This is the introduction for Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, uh, who is Senior Associate Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity, uh, the Taub Endowed Professor of Global Health and Infectious Disease, Professor of Pediatrics of Epidemiology and Population Health, and Chief Division of Pediatric Infectious Disease at Stanford University School of Medicine. She is Medical Director, uh, Infection Prevention and Control at the Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford. Uh, she also serves as Chair of the American Academy of Pediatric Committee, American Academy of Pediatrics Committee on Infectious Disease. Uh, Dr. Maldonado will discuss emerging infectious diseases and impact on people with developmental and intellectual disabilities. Um, uh, welcome, Dr. Maldonado. Thanks to all of you for being here today. So um, I uh, am going to shift uh, to a very different topic uh, this morning, and um, but uh, I think relevant to the community at large here. And um, today I'm going to talk about emerging infectious diseases, um, really, um, and I'll show you my um, objectives in a bit, but uh, really with an, a lens around developmental and intellectual disability populations. And so these are my disclosures. And the objectives today are to understand briefly the genesis and scope of global and U.S. emerging infectious disease threats to identify health equity considerations in the risk for exposure to emerging infectious diseases, and then really to look at the national and local framework around health equity risks for emerging infectious diseases, and, uh, and specifically uh, some examples from the disability community, but then again, around how the uh, COVID vaccines were uh, allocated during the early, especially during the early days of the uh, pandemic when vaccine uh, was scarce and uh, allocations uh, needed to be very focused and tailored. Um, and that is really to serve as a focus for ethical distribution of resources. So let me go ahead and start. And my uh, discussion will be essentially three different parts. Um, one will be, again, the talk about emerging and re-emerging diseases. Um, so that you have a context for why we need to be worried about these. I think the pandemic did tell us some, <clears throat> some of that. We know why emerging infectious diseases are important, but why we need to continue to think about this as a source of, of uh, concern for not only the U.S. population, but the, the global population. And then I'm going to talk about social determinants of health, including health equity issues, and then finally, I'll use COVID as an example of, of how we consider those social determinants and ethics in the allocation of resources with an eye, again, lens towards disability communities. So this particular slide is from the World Health Organization from about um, eight years ago or so. Um, this is pre-pandemic. I think we really don't want to look at this currently because well, the maps are not as accurate given the, the overwhelming nature of the pandemic. But this is a slide from the WHO Health Emergencies Program looking at um, uh, conditions around the world where the World Health Organization had to step in and uh, support um, uh, mitigation of a world, health, world emergencies. And you can see that they are primarily focused on the global south uh, because most of the northern uh, hemisphere uh, had resources to deal with their own uh, problems uh, on, on their own, but it does give you a good snapshot of the most vulnerable countries in the world. But the most important piece here for the context of our discussion is that you see that there are little um, circular markers um, around the world demonstrating what kind of emergency events there are by type of event, and then the size of the dots indicates the magnitude. And you can see that many of them are quite large, um, but almost all of them, except for one, are either in the infectious category in the teal or in the disaster category in the fuchsia or dark purple there. And so that is a major response that the world, world deals with on a regular basis. And then the one dot there in the um, uh, in, in China that you see there is really around, uh, I'm sorry, Russia, that you see there is really around a zoonosis. And um, that zoonosis is um, really infectious. It's a spillover of animal infections to humans. So even there, you see that the one that's not directly infectious related is infectious uh, 
related through animals. So we see that a lot of the world's emergencies aren't in these areas of infectious diseases. And so we wanna delve a little deeper and understand why that is. And you can see in this uh, just high level overview from the National Academy of Medicine, that um, if you just take a very high level overview of the most serious emerging and re-emerging diseases just in, in the last um, uh, uh, 15 years or so through 2015, that there have been a number already, uh, SARS, the original SARS, Zika virus, uh, cholera epidemics, Ebola outbreaks uh, throughout Africa, uh, chikungunya, um, H1N1, how we had a major pandemic in 2009, and then other diseases as well. So you see that these are ongoing and affect all parts of the world. And then if you look at this slide, this um, is a slide um, looking at before the pandemic, just a snapshot of how many people were in the air traveling on a, in a 24-hour period in, in the entire world. So you can see that uh, there are a lot of people moving and I was just at the airport yesterday, and I can tell you that um, it's gotten back to baseline. At least it seems like that to me. So I think uh, if there's a disease that can be transmitted somehow by movement uh, of people or animals or other environmental objects, such as water in boats, for example, and ships, that they can get around very, very quickly in a very short period of time. So we are all vulnerable to something that might be happening on the other side of the world if we're not prepared. Now, when we want to look at disease emergence factors, you know, what are influences of modern day life that have really primed this pump of disease exposures? Well, I think we don't need to look any further in terms of what's going on in the world overall in terms of urbanization increased transportation, as you saw with the map of flights, deforestation and reforestation around the world, land reclamation and irrigation, zoonoses, which again are interfaces with animal environments and uh, animal uh, viral or other uh, organism spillovers into humans, and then sadly, military activities and war. And um, we're in an era now uh, in the last 20 years where we've seen more internal and externally displaced people in the world than has ever been recorded in history. And so any of these disruptions to normal infrastructure um, or normal, normal ecosystems can lead to more exposure to pathogens, more opportunities for organisms that aren't pathogens to mutate and become pathogens. And then finally, if we look at climate change, <clears throat> just the number of uh, facets of climate change can uh, also uh, force uh, uh, these uh, opportunities for uh, pathogens to um, to uh, to come into contact with human populations, and those include natural disasters, extreme weather events, reduced and ineffective vector control, and reduced capacity to sustain clean water. Now, I'm not saying that those are the only impacts. Clearly, we just went through a, a hopefully. It's over, we think, but hopefully, for at least for now, we have gone through an incredibly severe drought, so we know what these look like from the, the impacts on other uh, systems, but from the infectious disease standpoint, they actually do contribute as well to our exposure to new diseases as we've seen um, in the last three years. Now, when we talk about meteorologic conditions, uh, we've seen that um, atmospheric concentrations of CO2 have increased at a record rate in 2016 to reach their highest point in over 800,000 years. And this is a severe threat to human health and well-being in many different ways. And we still don't understand the direct impacts of climate change and infectious diseases there, but we are learning more and more that they are important uh, relationships. And then finally, I have to um, mention that undernutrition as well. And again, in all of our vulnerable communities, undernutrition is always a problem. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, multi multifaceted impacts on disease and health. And this is also a greatest effect of climate change on health is the, uh, the undernutrition that could result from poor crop yields and, and, um, uh, and de decreased uh, uh, land use for crop uh, development. And these are undernutrition is a leading risk factor for lower respiratory tract infections, for example, and influence the severity of an underlying infections um, in the general population as well. So if you look at this, uh, this particular map from a study that was done in 2017, 
Um, this the group of, um, of climate scientists mapped and analyzed climate data and mortality data from uh, several different areas, 450 areas around the world. And they looked at the impact of changing temperatures. So modeling potential changes from less than five degrees to more than 25 degrees, uh, which would be a very big change um, across the world over time, um, based on the local morbidity and mortality rates uh, and attributed uh, new changes to either increasing heat or, increase, or, or increasing cold temperatures. And you can see on the right that uh, throughout all regions of the world, from North America in the upper left, all the way to Australia in the lower right, that um, cold weather in general tended to be associated over time with lower morbidity uh, and mortality risks, but um, warm temperatures, uh, in some cases, exponentially increased risk for mortality. And these are in populations across the board. So we know that our vulnerable populations are would be even at more risk. So these are important models. We don't know if they'll come true, and we know we have time to change them, but we need to be prepared for these. This is a slide that I used to teach my, uh, I'm an, a pediatric infectious disease epidemiologist. So we look at disease um, prediction, you know, where can we understand where diseases might uh, come from, where, how we can mitigate them, and where, and how can we mitigate them. And so when you look at climate change up at the top, you see we're talking about a number of climate-related variables in this model. We look at adaptation of climate change because of human society and affecting human society, so that's a bi-directional relationship, as well as the impact on uh, in infectious diseases, um, which central to that is the relationship with the, in, between the human host, the organism, and the transmission factors, including the environment. So you can see that it's a complex but, and bi-directional relationship. And this is just an example from the World Health Organization of ways that uh, climate change has already impacted uh, diseases in different parts of the world. And this is a very tiny snapshot of some examples that uh, where climate change can impact um, humans and have already impacted humans around the world. And we see here that if we think about the world's deadliest animals, we always think that we are the world's deadliest animal. And in many ways, I think that is true. But in terms of tracking uh, infectious diseases, a number of people killed per year by animals, um, despite our uh, shark week fears. Uh, sharks are not at the top of the list, they're way at the bottom. But mosquitoes are actually the biggest um, uh, killer of humans um, in the world because of the many impacts they have on disease transmission. And you can see here just briefly that uh, there are over a million deaths, if you, depending on how you count them, from vector borne diseases, diseases borne by uh, insects. And this is just a listing of some of them, including malaria, yellow fever, and other virus viral diseases. And more than half of the world lives in areas where these mosquitoes are present. This is just an outline of a paper uh, from the New England Journal of Medicine that looked at many new viruses that can be carried by just this one, um, uh, this one particular Aedes aegypti mosquito. So just looking at this particular mosquito, we know that there are many, many viruses that they can carry. Most of these, if not all, at least in this list, are not pathogenic or don't cause disease in humans, but we can see the potential for some of these to perhaps mutate and then become uh, diseases that can affect us. So we know that there are many uh, disease threats around us and we want to mit minimize those exposures and climate change and other um, impacts that I talked about earlier can in increase our exposure to these. And then finally, this is a slide looking at just um, specific insect-related outbreaks that occurred just in the 90s alone all around the world. You could see most of them occur in the global south because of weather and temperature conditions, but they can be spreading and we know that they're moving northward as climate changes. And then what I really wanted to focus on here is that climate change is a health equity issue, of course, because social and economic inequities as well as individual characters just place some individuals and communities at greater risk uh, for change, climate change related infections, such as occupation, housing conditions, poor infrastructure and chronic illness. And this slide is uh, sh showing part of the Ganges River in Calcutta by a woman who originally came from Calcutta and is a writer for the New York Times. And what she was saying is that 
uh, the way the city was constructed, all of the water from the monsoon season was, the city was set up so that water would flow directly back into the sacred Ganges River. But with urban sprawl uh, building up over the last few decades, a lot of the streets have not been designed to allow for flow back to the Ganges, leading to flooding and pooled water and ability for more mosquitoes and other pathogens to proliferate. So we know that planning is important and it tends to, a lack of planning tends to affect uh, most of our vulnerable socioeconomic populations. So let's move on and talk about social determinants of health. So I think I've laid out very briefly for you some of the arguments for why we need to take climate change seriously and why this uh, and then many of the environmental drivers are going to lead to more exposure to infectious pathogens. So we talk a lot about social determinants of health, but we want to understand exactly what they are. And these are the conditions that we know that um, are uh, that uh, occur in the places where people live, learn, work, and play. So their entire environment, and they affect a wide array, array of health risks and outcomes, including economic stability, education, social and community context, health and healthcare, housing, environment, uh, the built environment and neighborhoods. And there are now more and more data that demonstrate that as uh, our Dean Lloyd Miner here at Stanford likes to say in, a, in an article that he wrote, your zip code is actually more predictive of your life expectancy than your genetic code. So that is your genetic makeup and your access to medical care are clearly important, but today we know that they have less than a 50% impact on your life expectancy and your ability to lead a healthy and full potential life. That And this these social determinants are what drive really the majority of your uh, ability to live a healthy life. And we know that it, based on zip code, we see many ranges of health disparities. And I'll give you some examples. So the CDC has put together uh, some years ago, something called the Social Vulnerability Index or the SVI. And this was developed to look at communities that needed support before, during and after public health emergencies. And they are a measure of those social determinants of health that we outlined in the last slide using US census data. So these are population-based validated data. And they rank each county and census tract on 15 vulnerability factors that we kind of outlined. And they are grouped into four themes, socioeconomics, housing composition and disability, representation of racial and ethnic minority groups, and housing and transportation. Now, if you take these, you can actually come up with a vulnerability score by census tract, and you can rate these uh, areas as high vulnerability, uh, medium, or then low vulnerability. So they can be divided into quartiles of highest risk for um, exposure to um, uh, health inequities to lowest risk of exposure to health inequities. So in this slide, you can see from very early in the pandemic, this is about six months into the pandemic, when disease COVID, sp COVID disease spread was not extensive yet in terms of every population group being affected, you see that on the left, there's a map of the overall social vulnerability of the whole US uh, census tract database. And you can see in the dark blue areas, that just means that those are populations that high, have highest social and demographic vulnerabilities. Um, and then the, and then the, the lighter areas in, indicate lowest vulnerabilities. And what you see on the right is if you overlay the map of COVID-19 cases adjusted for population, the highest incidence areas early in the pandemic overlaid really very well with the vulnerability indices that the CDC developed. And many of us are looking to explore how we can use these vulnerability indices to try to understand maybe not how to predict disease, specific diseases, but how to predict which factors might allow people to become more vulnerable. So if you look at the slide on the right, we know that over time in the last three years, all zip codes and census tracts have had cases. But um, early on in a disease process um, or in a non-infectious disease process, you can actually outline where highest risk groups are, and then tease out what factors are affecting that risk. And here's an example. So what's the social vulnerability and risk of becoming a COVID-19 hotspot? And this was in June, 2020, very early in the pandemic. And using the data from SVI, um, what the analysis was to look for COVID-19 hotspots identified 
based on vulnerability scores from SVI. And, and you saw the general overall map, but if you looked at county by county, looking at metropolitan versus non-metropolitan areas, overall, the risk of the highest risk of uh, vulnerable, vulnerable populations compared to the lowest is, had a 2.4 times higher risk of COVID-19 hotspots compared to the lowest risk areas. However, if you looked at the, that risk between quartiles based on metropolitan versus non-metropolitan, you can see that the rural areas or the non-metropolitan areas were 15 times more likely to be vulnerable if they were also in a high vulnerability area of risk. So we know that those regions were much more pronounced and those can lead you to have public health interventions to say what is going on in those rural areas that are making the risk higher. Now, in addition, if you look at this slide, and I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, it's a little busy, but it lays out another point that you can tease down these vulnerabilities even further to say uh, we have, if you look at um, a higher percent of racial and ethnic minority residents, that impact is highest. So that dotted line, that dotted um, vertical line tells you that there's no increased risk. Below that line, increase lower risk, and above that line means higher risk. And you can see the highest risk is among uh, non-metropolitan county uh, residents, uh, areas where there's a high percentage of racial and ethnic minorities, um, and um, areas that have structures with more than 10 units that occur in small and medium metropolitan counties. And then um, in the uh, again, the non-metropolitan areas, higher percentage of households with more people in rooms are at highest risk. So you can then start to target as a public health agency what areas are going to be at higher risk for whatever disease you're looking at, and then try to understand why that is and maybe mitigate those risks. So for example, to high, we know now, of course, that housing density uh, put people at risk because they were less able to uh, distance from one another and more at risk for exposing other people. Whereas in uh, lower density housing, people were able to isolate better. You can see here that among hotspot counties, those with the highest social vulnerabilities had a much higher COVID incidence than the other three quartiles com combined. So you see the impact of the highest vulnerable populations really out outpaced the risk among the other three quartiles. So this we actually saw in real life, all of us who were caregivers day in and day out saw that those people that highest risk had social, demographic, economic, uh, disability, uh, uh, other underlying condition risks were much more likely to be impacted by COVID-19 than any other group. And then again, uh, looking at um, the odds ratios uh, for hospitalization, residents in a low income area was important. Age uh, in five year units, as you got older, the uh, risk went up. Obesity was important. Medicaid versus commercial insurance was important, but race really, uh, uh, led the pack in terms of the highest risk vulnerability for patients for hospitalization. So this is how you can use the SVI to track not just COVID, but diabetes, obesity, asthma, other underlying diseases, and where you see hotspots. Now, why do we see that? Well, the other thing that we need to do is we need to get granular um, in information regarding what social determinants of disease of health really do to people and when we looked at the pandemic, for example, we saw that things like poverty, frontline jobs, crowded living spaces, reliance on public transportation, food deserts or swamps, and inadequate insurance coverage all affect um, the ability of people to deal with COVID for very interesting way, in very interesting ways, in ways that we never predicted. Now, we knew that these inequities existed before, but we really saw them come to light in a horrible striking fashion with COVID because these were people who had limited resources and ability to avoid becoming infected for all of the reasons you see on this slide. Uninsured rates, for example, among non-white people are um, generally tend to be higher. Uh, uh, and so those that can also affect delayed care, delayed access to preventive care, but delayed access also to acute care, leading to people coming in for example, not just for COVID, but for uh, cancer diagnoses, for heart disease, for just about every condition, people will delay care because they don't have access to insurance. And that we know will lead to poor outcomes.
Um, so what can we think about within the context of people with disabilities? We need to make sure that actions are taken to ensure that people with disabilities can always access healthcare services and public health information they require. Um, of course, the COVID pandemic is just one example, but we know that this is true, as you've heard for the last day and a half, uh, for many other um, uh, disease and health and uh, uh, fears of influence. So making sure that our communities of disability have access, access um, either because they're uninsured or because they have special uh, health care uh, recommendations that they need to be given specifically, we need to make sure that happens. And we know specifically for a disease like COVID-19, uh, uh, people with disability may be at greater risk of contracting disease because of barriers, physical and environmental barriers to implementing basic hygiene measures, such as hand washing, simple things like hand washing, difficulty in acting social distancing, difficulty in wearing masks, for example, the need to touch things to obtain information from the environment or physical support, and especially barriers to accessing public health information and access to public health information that will provide resources. Um, so depending on underlying conditions, people with disability may be at greater risk of developing more severe cases, not only of developing disease, but developing more severity, as we know, because of COVID-19 exacerbating existing health uh, conditions, <clears throat> particularly those related to respiratory function, immune system function, heart disease, or diabetes. Barriers, to, as we said before, to accessing healthcare, those uh, individuals may also be disproportionately impacted by the outbreak because of serious disruptions to their supply chain or to the services they rely on on a daily basis. And um, the barriers experience can be reduced if key stakeholders are aware and take appropriate action. And I think one of the wonderful things about this annual conference is that we hear about a lot of resources for people within our communities who uh, around how to access services or who to go to to advocate for more services or more appropriate services and and not only and um uh, and very locally um uh, health equity appropriate um, actions to be taken to do that so for example the cdc very early on really tried to put together vaccine considerations for individuals with disabilities. And this is just one tiny example of the many webinars, town halls, uh, public health uh, um, uh, education uh, opportunities for providers and communities to understand what, uh, what we needed to know about people with disabilities and care what care providers importantly needed to know about uh, how to vaccinate and how to mitigate in other ways. So what can be done overall around uh, uh, infectious disease and disparities? I'm just, again, my own slice of this is around in mitigating infectious disease impacts. Well, specifically, we can talk about connecting people with resources to isolate food, cleaning supplies, and quarantine hotels. Now, quarantine hotels is very specific, for example, to COVID, but food and cleaning supplies are universal for other, not just this pandemic, but other infectious disease pr problems that might occur in communities. Having, in, for example, with COVID-19, one of the things that we really understood as a, an, in, as a medical community and as um, healthcare support communities was creating uh, low to no barriers to access to resources such as community-based testing, rapid response for individuals who were ill, uh, and then of course, when it came along to COVID vaccinations to make them free and accessible in your community without having to travel great distances to have access to those. And this is a DEI or a diversity equity inclusion action framework that was developed um, around specifically how do we take um, culturally relevant um, considerations, uh, especially around an infectious disease, which we never really thought about. I think uh, many of us who work in this field did think about this uh, in our own spheres, but it was not a global or, or a, uh, a overall umbrella consideration in dealing with diseases before the pandemic, I think in any real um, uh, public way. But we need to think about making culturally relevant decisions by asking strategic questions, empowering teams to help strategize around po vulnerable populations, 
and ground truth solutions for diverse groups. We need to we needed to really act to support our diverse communities, not just talk at them, but have people at the table telling us what their needs were, where their gaps were, and how could those be supported, and um, including basic needs for um, the providers and the people in the community who were the advocates and the leaders, because we needed them to stay healthy and have as wellness considerations as they cared for populations by providing emotional and mental health support. And then by using a, a research lens and an academic lens, which I know is very hard to think about in a pandemic, but we need those to develop ways to understand evidence and best practices for next steps. I think one of the things that we probably didn't do as clearly as well as we could have, and we need to really move forward in understanding is how to communicate thoughtfully and inclusively not just by showing empathy and clarifying the big picture, but by having a unified and um, integrated communication strategy that works not only at the local level, but moves all the way up to the very highest level. level. So messaging is clear and consistent and evolve as it evolves rapidly, which it did during the pandemic, that people understand the, the evolution of those communications so that they can have trust and confidence that those messages are, are appropriate. And then one other area, which I thought was interesting, was digitizing a lot of this. That is keeping track of protocols so that we have a digital footprint, understand what we did in the past so that we can build on what we've learned to keep track of what to do next. So let me just briefly in the last um, few minutes uh, talk about COVID-19 vaccines and our equity considerations there, uh, because I think that that was a really important area to think about. Um, around um, how to allocate this particular resource. So this is something that uh, the CDC does whenever they consider any vaccine or any intervention is really this important triad of science, implementation, and ethics. From the science perspective, um, for example, with COVID, the idea of looking at specific data around disease burden and then ba ba balance of benefits and harms of a vaccine, we always need to take into consideration benefits and harm was really the scientific um, platform. From the allocation um, and implementation side, really looking at the values of the target group. And in this case, it would be the disability community. What are their values around, um, uh, of, around COVID-19 disease and what they value around support and how a vaccine, for example, could fit into their into their values. And not only that, but the feasibility in a community. And then and last but clearly not least was the ethics. And this is um, identifying ethical consideration supply. But in any in any situation, really trying to understand uh, this particular um, um, outcome. And so if you look at um, the ethical principles, there were five interim ethical principles that were set around minimizing harms, maximizing benefits, considering equity, justice, fairness, and transparency. Now, this is above and beyond just the clinical data uh, on vaccine effectiveness and the science part. This is really about the ethical principles. And so during the phase one uh, time, remember those early days when we had nothing really to give people to prevent disease other than masking and distancing. And uh, those, uh, the um, the one thing that we, we were trying to develop is when we get a vaccine, we're going to have to roll that vaccine in because we know we're not going to have a high supply at the very early days. So the idea really then came down to providing um, uh, early um, access to healthcare personnel and essential workers and those with uh, with um, high risk for underlying medical conditions, as well as those over 65. Um, and the principles, as we talked about, were here, looking at uh, the five principles that we talked about. And looking, and, and we did that, we addressed those issues by looking at what we call an ETR framework or an evidence to recommendation. And these are all of the different domains where we take into consideration questions that will give us a balanced approach to understanding whether the intervention is worthwhile, and if it is worthwhile, how to strategize to allocate this to what the particular populations that would best uh, benefit. So there's the questions are, is this a public health 
importance? Is, is this problem of public health importance, number one? Number two, uh, are there benefits and harms that are being taken into consideration so that we know are the benefits, um, uh, out, out, do the benefits outweigh the undesirable effects? The values, does the target population itself feel that the desirable effects are large relative to the undesirable effects? Acceptability, feasibility, resource use, and then equity. And when we talk about the vaccine or the intervention, in this case, it was COVID-19 vaccines and the problem was COVID disease, but this can be any disease. And this nice framework is actually takes hundreds of hours to work through to make sure that we are getting key stakeholders across all populations to make sure that we're addressing these questions in a balanced and transparent way. And by the way, all of this information is available on the CDC website. If people want to go back, they can go to the CDC website to the ACIP website, which is the Vaccine Advisory Group. And all of these sessions are recorded and all of the slides are available. So when people really wanted to go back and look, they could see how the many, many hours of consideration were, were uh, took place to come to the final conclusions. So these were the proposed phases of COVID vaccination. And we started off with a phase 1A, 1B, 1C, and then a phase two. And you see that, as we talked about earlier, healthcare providers, frontline workers, and essential workers were embedded early on, as were individuals over 65, and especially those who lived in long-term care facilities. And then next were people uh, younger, 16 to 64, with high-risk medical conditions. And then finally, other age groups. And then you're, you see that we break down the whole U.S. population by millions so that we knew what the size of each of those populations were and when they would be coming in to get their vaccine. So you see in the light blue, healthcare providers and people working and living in long-term care facilities were the first group. And then closely thereafter, frontline workers came in. So this was our strategy to allocate uh, resources of a very dear resource at the time. Although I know now we live with vaccines like they're no big deal, but these were actually almost miraculous vaccines that really did uh, reduce the risk of, of infection, uh, hospitalization, and death. And again, for a specific population, I, and as a pediatrician, I need to call out that uh, as with the disability community, some uh, populations were maybe more likely to have severe consequences of infection. So we know that children with these complications and others were at higher risk for severe disease, not necessarily just infection, but severe disease. And you can see in this older slide, this was true throughout the pandemic, that obesity in particular in the young children was a huge impact, had a huge impact on children's ability, not just, not just to get infected, but to have severe outcomes as well as asthma and other conditions. And then finally, when we look at this particular slide, looking at um, overall uh, fatalities, so the more mortality rate by age and comorbidity, I, this is really the only slide that I could find that really laid this out in this way. So the color coding is the type of, of risk factor. And then at the bottom on the x-axis, you see the age groups. So for hypertension and diabetes, you see in the left, they were both strong predictors of high risk for hospitalization and death in almost every age group. Dementia was a big risk in the elderly population. Heart and lung disease were risks across um, all ages, but most more likely in older age groups. And obesity, as I mentioned before, was a, a major risk factor in the young. So when we take these considerations into account, so for example, with the disability community, we need to really, really focus on that group that may have a double hit in terms of their ability to suffer uh, more intense outcomes than the general population. And so in summary, I think I wanted to just take you through a quick journey um, around the world through talking about global environmental and societal conditions that lead to more emerging and re-emerging diseases. We're not done with them, but I hope that the world has learned a lesson on how to be prepared to address them as they come. Uh, social determinants of health, of course, then have increasing downstream effects on mitigation of disease risk and access to quality health care. So one of the things I've been talking about with some of my colleagues lately is not just to look at the downstream effects, but how do we mitigate upstream these social determinants of health so that they are gone and we don't have those downstream impacts. Now we can't get rid of them all, but how do we mitigate at the, at the upstream level to minimize their impact? Um, bias among healthcare workers, we didn't have time to talk about that. 
But biases, whether well-intentioned or not, and these are not to say that healthcare workers are biased intentionally, but there are inherent biases in everybody. And these could negatively affect quality of care because people assume that everyone has similar access to every um, resource. And that clearly, as we know, is not true. So how do we educate our workforce and our public health agencies by advocacy and a seat at the table to make sure that people understand how our disability and other communities may have disproportionate risks uh, that the general population does not see. And then finally, the COVID-19 pandemic, more than anything else in the last uh, century, I would say really underlined the disparities that arise due to societal conditions and interventions that aim to provide the conditions of daily life that improve the conditions of daily life can help to increase access to quality care and to help improve healthcare outcomes and quality of life. So I will stop there and thank you for your attention. Dr. Maldonado, thank you so much for a, a, a major presentation. Um, you've provided us with so much information. Um, and so I'm gonna go with the first question um, in the Q&A, uh, so, uh, uh, which says, thank you for covering such a comprehensive topic. I'd appreciate your suggestions or recommendations on COVID boosters and your thoughts regarding the future of such boosters, as well as masks, social distancing, et cetera, especially for those with disabilities living in group homes and other congregate living situations. Yeah, I think those are our most vulnerable populations, obviously, because um, we know that there are underlying factors that put our just many of our disability populations at higher risk for bad disease outcomes. I think we're aware of that. Not Maybe not necessarily for risk for exposure, although if you're living in nursing, skilled nursing or healthcare facilities, you can be at higher risk because of the nature of those facilities. So I think in that situation, masking and distancing are still going to be important, depending on how well um, the screening strategies are to keep people out who may be having experiencing mild symptoms. And in some ways, it's a little harder now because we don't have access to massive testing facilities. We are not really focusing on people staying home if they're sick. And that is, as an infection control physician, that is what I battle even before the pandemic every single day at work. Don't come to work sick. I think we have given people more permission now and access to resources to be able to work from home or not come to work at all if they're sick, not only for your own health, but to prevent you from infecting other people who might not have the same um, outcome if they become ill. So really keeping those policies in place for high-risk populations is critical. I'm going to be on a plane to uh, London this evening, and I wear my mask still when I fly. I notice a lot of people don't, but I um, I don't have any underlying risk factors. Um, but I, uh, well, I mean, I'm older than 65, so I'll just disclose that. But but I do want to make sure that I don't, not only, I don't want, if I can have an opportunity not to get sick, I'm going to do that. But I also don't want to expose other people to wherever I'm going, if I'm going to a meeting. And we still need to take this seriously. We still don't know what the longer term impacts of COVID-19, long, long COVID are. And what we, I mean, I still see disinformation in major uh, journals and periodicals saying COVID, long COVID doesn't really exist or it's been overblown and it's not really important. And we don't know that yet. We are, we are seeing, I am seeing myself, individuals who have long COVID complications. So who are those people and how do we mitigate that? We don't know. So in the meantime, we have to be careful. And so specifically around the vaccine, I would say that there are a, a really helpful guidelines that amplify the ability of immunocompromised um, people and others who are at higher risk to get additional doses, not only of the basic vaccine, but of boosters. However, um, at this point, we are kind of done with the new recommendations for boosters. We think that the five boost, the five doses, the three basics plus the two boosters for the immunocompromised population are kind of where we are at this point. There's no evidence at this point because of widespread population immunity that and the mitigation of uh, severity based on vaccination that we need additional doses at this time. However, it's pretty clear to me, although it's not been said formally, that the Food and Drug Administration is probably going to recommend a bivalent 
a booster, possibly combined with a flu vaccine in the fall. And the, the way that will look is not clear yet, but I'm pretty sure that we are going to have at least for the next year or two uh, fall boosters. At this point, if people are up to date on all of their basic boosters, uh, the basic primary series plus boosters, and what we know, by the way, is that only 15% of the U.S. population is up to date on their boosters. So that is an easy way to get back into, um, into compliance to protect oneself, especially because it's not clear that the vaccines are going to be free for much longer. So we need to make sure people are vaccinated before we have to unfortunately maybe stop start paying for them. And then the fall will be a really critical time to start thinking about updating. And I think everybody in the world <laughs> should be getting a flu booster every year. There's no reason for us not to be getting flu vaccine boosters every year. They save tens of thousands of lives every year. Well, um, Dr. Maldonado, thank you so very much for your presentation. Thank you so much. Have a good day.